Now we're going to introduce um, our second speaker of the day, Natasha Dowie. So um, Dr. Natasha Dowie began her academic career here at the University of Liverpool, where she spent her PhD studying volcanology and pyroclastic flows. After seven years of working in the energy sector on subsurface risk mitigation, um, she, um, she became a, um, a now a senior lecturer at physical geography at um, Sheffield Hallam University. Her research focuses on explosive volcanic hazards and associated um, uncertainty with their interpretation, as well as sustainability, diversity, and inclusion in geoscience. Natasha is also an editor of the website Geoscience for the Future, which is great and definitely worth a read. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Dr. Dowie. Uh, thank you. Can everyone see my screen okay? And then can you hear me okay? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Natasha. I'm course lead of BSc Environmental Science at Sheffield Hallam and a lecturer in physical geography. Many thanks to Sam and Chris and all the Herman team for inviting me today. Like Dan, it's quite an honour to be here. Um, having been a PhD student at Liverpool, I attended many of these Herman events many moons ago. Was always very inspired by those who spoke. I can't promise to be as inspiring as those people today, but hopefully this talk will make you think and raise some questions and motivate you all to see some new possibilities in geoscience. So my talk today is how can we create a more sustainable and equitable geoscience for the future. Now this project uh, and the ideas that I talk about in this talk stem from conversations with lots of people, um, lots of really great people over the past three years. Too many to mention as I'm zipping through um, the slides, but enough to squeeze in a very small font onto this title slide. So you might be able to spot yourself there. So thank you to all of these wonderful people who've helped shape my understanding in this topic. So what am I going to talk about? Um, first of all, I'm going to start pondering the impacts of geoscience, which is why we're all here for this kind of theme of the Herdman Symposium this year. Then I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about equity in geoscience. I'm going to talk about the sustainability of UK geoscience and then finish up by considering what we want geoscience for the future to be and how we can achieve that. And as I move through these subjects, I'll give a flavour of some of the projects that I'm currently involved in. And I'm very happy for you to contact me afterwards, um, after my talk today, it, in places it will feel a bit whistle stop. Um, but I'm happy to discuss if you'd like to find out more. Whenever we talk about equity and diversity and inclusion, I think having a bit of positionality up front of who I am and who I'm not is pretty important. I'm a field geologist by training. Um, I gained my PhD here at Liverpool, analysing sediments deposited during explosive volcanic eruptions by the hazards known as pyroclastic density currents. I then worked as a research geoscientist in the oil industry for seven years, where I spent my time turning back the geological clock to unpick past environments in sedimentary basins all over the world. In 2019, I took the plunge and came back to academia because I really enjoyed teaching. And I did that first at the University of Hull in a temporary lectureship. And now I found a permanent home, thankfully, at Sheffield Hallam University, where I spend my time drifting between physical geography and environmental science and bringing geology to those two disciplines. In terms of who I am as a person, I've always loved exploring Earth's landscapes after growing right up, um, growing up right on top of a big lump of granite in Madrid in Cornwall. I've been influenced by my family's working class roots. So this is my Nana here on her way to work in a munitions factory during the war in Cornwall and Hale. Um, my dad's involvement with trade unions has also influenced me. I've been shaped by very strong women in my family, by my mum and my sisters-in-law. And I'm now doing my best to bring up two strong women of my own. Um, I've always been passionate about social justice, but I'm not a scholar of equity, diversity and inclusion. There are specialists who are. I'm also not a social scientist. As I said, I'm a geologist, but I'm learning more every day about why it's important that myself, that geologists work with those who are specialists in these topics to learn more about them. And I'm doing my best to encourage others to do this too. 
Because I'm guessing that not many in the audience here are going to be familiar with some of the things that I talk about today, I've got some definitions up front that may hopefully be useful so that you can follow my talk and not get too lost if I throw unfamiliar terms at you. You'll note that this is a very different kind of talk, and as Monty Python would say, and now for something completely different, this is a very different kind of talk from what we've just had from Dan's wonderful talk on faults and earthquakes. First of all, what do I mean when I say EDI or JEDI? Um, what do I mean by equity and justice? There are many versions of this cartoon that I've shown here, but I like this one the best. Equality is when you give everybody the same. This doesn't account for any additional barriers that some groups may face. Equity is when you account for those barriers in your interventions to ensure that everyone has the same experience regardless of the barriers that they may face. And justice is getting rid of those barriers altogether. Here and there in this talk, I'll use the term BAME on some graphs. This stands for Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic, and it's worth stating that we only use this abbreviation because of the way that the equality data is published by the government, by the Higher Education Statistics Authority. We recognize that this grouping is far from ideal and homogenizes different identities, but for the purpose of the data in this talk, it is a useful tool. I'll also mention colonialism and concepts around decolonizing the curriculum. There are many definitions of this, but I quite like this one from Keele University. Decolonization is about creating spaces and resources for a dialogue amongst all members of a university on how to imagine and envision all cultures and knowledge systems in the curriculum. And hopefully what this means will become clearer with a couple of the projects that I mentioned. I'll also mention both sustainability in reference to the sustainable development goals, which you may be familiar with. And this is the concept of meeting the needs of the present without compromising future generations. I'll also mention the word sustainable, but in the context of longevity, okay? So let's get going. First of all, I'd love to know what geology is to you. To tell me, we're gonna try uh, some high-tech fanciness here. So this could, you know, crash and burn in a, in a fireball, but we're going to try. So all you need to do is to type www.menti.com into your browser on either your computer or your phone, and you need to enter the code 69201909. And I want you to, you can put as many answers as you like, but I'd like you to say, what is geology? Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask um, Sam or Chris to maybe put that in the chat, if that's okay so that everyone can see that, www.menti.com and that code 69201909, okay? And we'll come back to that at the end, so you've got time. Okay, and that's anonymous, so don't worry, I won't be chasing anyone for incorrect answers. Okay, so for me, geology and geoscience more broadly means a whole world of possibility. It's an ability to work across time and space, within communities, tackling the climate crisis, addressing hazards, addressing our energy and resource needs. And it's now well documented that our subject is crucial to the UN's sustainable development goals and to other global frameworks like the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. And the work that Dan has just spoken about speaks to that with analysis of earthquake hazard. Joel, G Joel Gill, Flo Bullo and Ian Stewart have all documented this and written on these links between geoscience and the SDGs. And the charity Geology for Global Development, which Joel Gill is the executive director of, working with the Geological Society have created this excellent poster to help showcase this, which many of you I'm sure will have seen and be aware of. However, it is important to understand that this beautiful picture of possibility is not a given. For us to tackle these challenges, we need to work across communities in an equitable, sustainable and ethical way. How can we best do this? Well, it seems sensible that to begin with, we need to ensure equitable practices within our own discipline. However, unfortunately, geoscience, particularly in the richest countries in the world, is not equitable. Key articles in the past few years have highlighted inequity in geoscience in the US, with people of colour dramatically underrepresented. So along with a group of collaborators, I looked into the data on racial diversity available for UK geoscience, and it was similarly shocking. It turns out that the geosciences, 
geology, geographical science, environmental science are the least diverse physical science subjects in UK higher education. That's comparing to subjects like chemistry and physics, for example. And this graph is a bit of a, it's a, bit of a dry graph, apologies, but it shows the proportion of black, Asian and minority ethnic students taking up study in geoscience topics. And it's an average, average data from 2014 to 2019. In this graph, UGR means undergraduate, PGR means postgraduate. You can see that this data is then compared against UK government census data, both in total and also just for young people, 18 to 24. And it's important to note that this census data is now pretty out of date. This is the 2011 data. So once that 2021 census data is released, we can be almost certain that these figures will go up. And we can also see here average figures for sciences as a whole, for the physical sciences as a whole. So you can see from this graph that although over 18% of young people in the UK, 18 to 24 year olds, identify as black, Asian or minority ethnic, only between six and 10% of geoscience students do. And if we look at the more recent data, HESA has updated its reporting criteria since 2019. So you'll see that geology now appears as earth science. But if we look at this more recent data from 2019 to 2020 academic year, we can see that the picture is not getting better. It's, this isn't improving with time. And in this chart, I have added the total student population. And you can see that for undergraduate study in 2019 to 2020, almost 28% of students um, identified as black, Asian or minority ethnic. But still in the geosciences, we're hovering at around 10%. It's also important to note that although I'm presenting and looking at data on race here, that we need to recognize and acknowledge intersectionality. And that's basically where people's intersecting identities may mean they face discrimination and barriers on more than one front. Discrimination because of race, as well as disability, discrimination um, of race, as well as gender, leading to heightened underrepresentation. And when we look into the data on this, we can see that during the last five years, there have been two years for both geology and physical geography where no black women took up full-time postgraduate study. So we need to dig down into this and understand why other geosciences is so disproportionately white. And many factors have been recorded, um, both anecdotally and published to account for this disparity. There are unhelpful stereotypes of our subject that still persist, even today in 2022, of white, able-bodied men out on mountaintops. And, you know, just doing an internet search recently for geologists on Shutterstock, you know, the top results were all white people, okay? Our disciplines have roots that are deeply intertwined with imperial expansion. Geoscience was a tool of colonialism, particularly in terms of mapping, surveying, resource, resource exploitation. And this legacy of exploration, exploitation, extraction is still felt today. So I've used just one example here, the um, very uh, well publicized example of Rio Tinto damaging indigenous sites recently in Australia. And this has created a legacy of distrust in some communities. It's also been suggested that career perceptions are not as strong for the geosciences as for topics with clear and stable career goals like medicine, for example. And these career perceptions are particularly important for people who may be second generation immigrants where their families have strong uh, beliefs that they want their children to go into jobs that are stable with a clear career goal that provide a clear uh, long term career. And Accessibility of natural environments to certain communities may also play a role. So in a recent unpublished Geological Society of London survey, 60% of undergraduate geology students mentioned a lifelong interest in the natural environment. But it's a known fact that natural environments are less accessible to children from urban settings and to children from low income households. So in the UK, over 90% of Black African, Pakistani and Bangladeshi people live in urban locations. And low-income households are more likely to be Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Chinese or Black than white. DEFRA report that Black and Asian families are the least likely group to visit rural areas. 
And when students of colour enter university, they are faced with challenges not experienced by their white peers. These factors are laid out in reports, such as the Leading Roots Broken Pipeline report. There's a proven access gap to high tariff Russell Group universities, where much research is carried out and where students, if they pass through those universities, are more likely to take up research careers and more likely to become lecturers, for example. So for example, black, Asian and minority ethnic applicants to mathematical, physical and life science subjects at Oxford are 5% less likely to receive an offer than their white counterparts, even if they have exactly the same prior attainment. In 2018 to 19, black students made up just 3.9% of students at high tariff universities, compared to 12.2% at lower tariff universities. Many universities are now recognizing that they have a degree awarding gap where students of color consistently score less highly in their final degree outcomes than their peers. And it's been suggested that this is due to bias. Within geoscience specifically, a heightened lack of diversity can lead to feelings of isolation. Across the UK, just 10% of professors identify as black, Asian or minority ethnic. But of the 2,390 staff working in earth, marine and environmental sciences, in 2018-19, only 90 of these identified as black, Asian and minority ethnic. That's just 3.9%. And that was the second lowest figure of all science, engineering and technology disciplines. Fieldwork practices, such as residential co-ed trips over Ramadan or a strong alcohol culture, can also be exclusionary to some cultures. And furthermore, geoscience teaching has still not modernized sufficiently to address its colonial history, which may lead to non-white students feeling marginalized and as though their voices and history is not heard. So what can we do about these significant challenges? There's a lot, there's a lot that we can do. We need to remove the structural barriers and implicit biases that predominantly detriment underrepresented students. This means making meaningful efforts to decolonize and address power balances in our subjects, to change application practices to be based on merit and not just on access to resources. We need to make fieldwork more inclusive. We can aim to address long-lived inequity by providing ring-fenced opportunities for students of colors, which are students of color, apologies, which are interventions that have been proved to be successful in the USA by geoscientists such as Kahali Dutt. We need to make meaningful steps to broaden participation, ensuring that students from all backgrounds have opportunities to see the careers that geosciences can offer. And we need to develop inclusive curricula that are relevant to all cultures. We need to see this as a whole pipeline approach, a whole life cycle approach from school to undergraduate to postgraduate research to ensuring more diversity in lecturing staff. But how can we have the biggest impact? How can we have a meaningful and lasting impact in tackling these long baked in problems? It's difficult to work on these challenges on a department by department scale. We need to break out of our traditional silos and work across subjects within our own discipline and across sector with other disciplines. And for any interventions to be sustainable, they need time, funding and appropriate oversight. They need monitoring and evaluation from a group that is diverse in both background and in specialisms. Student voices need to be at the heart of these efforts. So I'd like to mention briefly a couple of projects that I'm involved with that are hoping to evidence real change. These are not the only projects or the only interventions that are needed, but hopefully they'll give you a bit of an idea of the start of the work that's being done in this area. So our Equator project recently received six months of NERC funding, so Natural Environment Research Council funding, to trial some interventions to remove barriers, increase participation and improve retention of Black, Asian and minority ethnic students in geography, earth and environmental science. And the reason I've got this huge amount of logos on this slide, it isn't just to show off all of our collaborators, it's just to make the point that to do this, we've had to bring together a significant group of people, excellent researchers with lived experience of these issues, a steering committee comprising students, professional bodies, grassroots organizations, 
various universities and an EDI specialist. We have representatives from all of the subjects together because the challenges faced by these subjects have many parallels. And in terms of our activities so far, we started the project um, in December, we launched in January, and we've just started matching students and mentors as part of a new mentoring network. And because everything is operating on such a quick time span, we had just two weeks from advertising the network to starting pairing. And in that time, over 80 scientists applied to be mentors, which was an amazing response. And over 30 students, over 30 Black, Asian and minority ethnic students applied to be mentored. We're soon going to launch a ring-fenced, fully funded research school that's going to really focus on showcasing careers, providing application and interview workshops, providing those uh, connections and that training that sometimes students can feel isolated from. And we've also brought together a working group of academics who work in PhD recruitment from across the country to develop more equitable application practices. So as I mentioned, this project is just six months long and we're focusing specifically on improving equity in postgraduate research. There's only so much that one project on this can do, but we're hoping that through monitoring and evaluating these actions as we go, a form of action research, that we can develop recommendations that we can share to become implemented more widely. Other tree of science projects were also funded in this NERC scheme, such as a project led by Bethany Fox at Huddersfield, which focuses on making geoscience more equitable at the undergraduate level to a whole range of underrepresented groups. So I would really recommend that you have a look on the NERC website and get in touch with those projects if you're interested. Earlier on, I mentioned this idea of tackling colonial foundations, and it's crucial to work with decolonial scholars on this goal towards this aim. Recently, the Arts, the Arts and Humanities Research Council teamed up with the Natural Environment Research Council to offer funding to collaborations that brought together social and physical scientists. The funding pot was titled Hidden Histories of Environmental Science, Acknowledging Legacies of Race, Social Injustice and Exclusion to Inform the Future. I'm very excited to be part of a project led by Rebecca Williams at the University of Hull on this. And this is a collaboration between geoscientists like myself with an interest in these themes, but also specialists in decolonial history and colonial geography. And we want to understand some of the hidden histories of our subject, such as the slave connections of prominent ge geoscientists like Henry de la Beche. Our team will explore archives of our oldest geoscience institutions to examine how geoscience knowledge has been created, what circumstances led to that creation, who helped with the creation of that knowledge? Who is recognized, who is acknowledged and who isn't? What power imbalances has this knowledge led to? And we aim to use this work to develop open access curriculum content that can be used by others in their teaching. I've also been working um, with a group led by Steve Rogers at Keel. Um, the University of Keel are undertaking a very broad decolonization program across their university. And we've worked with um, a colonial scholar there, post-colonial scholar there, Lisa Lau, on a paper trying to explain decolonization for geologists. That's a preprint at the moment online, but again, I'd recommend that you take a look. These projects are just some examples of the work going on in this realm in geoscience. UK geology has lagged behind other disciplines in decolonization in recent years. Geography is far further ahead than us. So it's exciting to see geoscientists making efforts to team up with other disciplines to carry out this important investigation of our subject's colonial legacy. There's more to be said on all of that work. Perhaps I can come back in a couple of years to report on their successes or failures. For now, let's move on from equity to think about sustainability. So I started this talk by explaining how crucial geoscience is for every aspect of sustainable development. It underpins society as we know it, and it will be crucial for a more sustainable society in the future. But as well as needing an equitable subject to achieve this vision of future geoscience, we need to still have students taking it up at university to be sustainable. 
I'm not suggesting we recycle UK geoscience, this cartoon is just to suggest that we need to keep it going. There's been a well-documented decline in admissions to UK geology degrees, in particular in recent years. And this has sadly led to a number of excellent geology courses being completely dropped from their university prospectuses, often at smaller or non-Russell Group universities. If this continues, this situation looks set to result in geology only being taught in the larger Russell Group departments, which will certainly not be a good thing for the subject in terms of long term sustainability or in terms of the diversity of the subject. The causes of this decline are likely closely related to factors playing out at pre-university level discussed in a paper by Dan Boatwright and others in 2019. Students are now less likely than ever to be offered a geology GCSE and unable to take a fourth subject at A-level, which may be a likely cause for decline in A-level geology. Alongside these structural issues within schooling, which are very difficult for us as individuals to influence, I often hear the comment that numbers are dropping because the media is always painting geoscience in a poor light, in a bad light. And there's sometimes a sense that this entire situation may be out of our hands. So what does the general public really think? And can we influence that? That's not easy to answer. A group of us led by Steve Rogers at Keele and Sam Giles at Birmingham decided to explore this with a survey to investigate perceptions of geology. The survey was answered by 559 people, 66% of whom had studied geology at some level and the remainder who hadn't. We're keen to understand how geologists think about geology compared to how the general public think about geology. Respondents ranged from 16 to 79. And I must stress that these are very initial results, hot off the press and yet to be fully analyzed, but I will share a little of them. Out of 559 responses, it's worth mentioning that the word boring was mentioned over 100 times. The total number of individuals identifying as white who completed the survey is 82%, but maybe higher, as there were also some answers like British or European, where there was no way of knowing ethnicity. And this is an interesting point, because we really wanted to uh, target as diverse a group as possible and sent this survey out through multiple networks. We collected it in a matter, in a manner sometimes known as snowball sampling, where the survey was shared by people in a network. The whiteness of the responses could reflect the dominance of white people in geology networks. It could also be interpreted to show that people have a bias that geology is for white people and therefore share or participate in the survey based on that basis. Also of interest is that we have a majority of female respondents and this could again be a response, this could be again a factor of this snowball sampling technique or it may be down to evidence that women are more likely to participate in online surveys. So to show a little bit of this, yeah, there's that boring, it's a bit depressing. When asked what is geology, people who had studied the subject predominantly mentioned the earth and processes. When asked what is geology, people who had not studied the subject overwhelmingly said one word, rocks, probably to be expected. When asked what do geologists do, those who had not studied geology predominantly said, you guessed it, rocks. Oh no, I hear you cry. Geology is so much more than rocks. But, and perhaps this is the most interesting answer of all, of those who had studied geology, when asked what do geologists do, many people couldn't put their finger on what, how to sum it up. Things was the most common word it's too broad for a simple definition. It depends on the job. We do do a lot of things. We do. Geologists do a lot of things. Oh, hang on. Um, so although these results still need thorough analysis, I think these early glimpses raise some questions. Um, I won't necessarily answer them here, but I think we as geoscientists need to be able to communicate all the incredible things our subject is, all the jobs that geoscientists go into. We need to ask ourselves, are we the best ambassadors for our subject that we can be? So what we're gonna do now is have a quick look at what you said. Now, 
we'll see if this has worked. I can see it has, I'm relieved. Okay, rocks. We do rocks and we do do rocks. People are still desperately typing now. So hopefully you can all see this um, screen. Um, can everyone see that? Sam, has that come up, the Mensi answers? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so as you can see, sustainability is a lot higher in the group in this meeting. Now, this is really interesting because sustainability and climate did not come out high on our survey, even in people who have studied the subject, okay? Um, so I think this, and I, like, but I know that from that first slide that Janine showed at the very top of this session, that actually a lot of the people on this call have studied geology, so I, I clicked with that. So this is really interesting, the world's behavior, connecting the sciences, multidisciplinary. This is a, um, a reason that many people in that survey um, at the early look seem to say is why they entered the subject. They entered the subject for its multidisciplinary nature, because they love the outdoors, because they wanted to study Earth's processes. But, you know, a lot of people said boring around this subject. And a lot of people also mentioned the word rocks, people who hadn't studied geology. Do we need to go beyond? Do we need to go beyond rocks? Um, so yeah, thank you very much for participating in that. I'm going to go back to the slide deck, which hopefully you can now see. So I'm going to kind of bring this together a little bit now. Um, what is the future of geoscience? Um, I'm just going to give some thoughts and ideas here, but I'm sure that the other fantastic speakers in today's lineup will also bring you many more inspirational ideas to think about. At the very top of this talk, I mentioned that for me, geoscience's major impact is its alignment with the Sustainable Development Goals. And for me, it's crucial that the future of our subject is aligned with those goals. So the content we teach must be fit for purpose. We must ensure that we are adapting to a net zero energy transitioning agenda with clear alignment to the more sustainable future that we seek. For example, as this chart of changing degree names through time shows, more and more geoscience master's courses are now transitioning. They're changing, they're aligning themselves to be more sustainable, more focused on the energy transition. This is work by Jen Roberts and a group of us um, presented recently at the Tectonic Studies Group Conference. And you can see that some uh, courses have been uh, discontinued altogether, such as um, the Royal Holloway Petroleum Geoscience Masters, for example, which has become energy geoscience. Imperial now has a environmental data science and machine learning uh, masters. Manchester now has a masters in sustainable geoscience. Now, these all sound fantastic. They sound incredibly inspiring. This can only be a good thing, right? But it's important to ensure that these changes go beyond just this name switch, you know, beyond something that is kind of marketing purposes for recruitment. We need to ensure that all these courses and everything that we're teaching across UK HE has more sustainable content and sustainable research project opportunities for students. Jen Roberts at Strathclyde is currently doing some analysis on this with us to try and understand how student projects at these places have transitioned with time and whether these changes are borne out in research. And although this talk is mostly focused on the UK, this need for a clear alignment of geoscience education with sustainable development is obviously a global issue. Embedding geoscience education for sustainable development will be particularly important in countries who may be hit hardest by the climate crisis. So the charity Geology for Global Development, of which I'm a trustee and of which the guys have mentioned at the top of this um, Herman Symposium, has worked with collaborators at the universities of Hull, Nairobi and Kenyatta. And they've recently been working on a novel project to assess the geoscience education and workforce needs required to meet the development plans. And these uh, plans are laid out in a document called Kenya Vision 2030, which shows how Kenya wants to align the sustainable development goals. It, it aligns its own development plans with those of the UN. And by mapping how geoscience fits into key government policy, such as this, 
we really can show a set of recommendations that, if implemented, will strengthen geoscience education to meet that vision. Now, this kind of work from geoscientists within Kenya, from external charities like Geology for Global Development, working within policy, is just another example of the diverse roles that geoscientists can take in the future. So working together in government, um, as well as in roles that we perhaps more traditionally associate with geoscience to ensure that key strategic ambitions can actually be met. And I spoke at the start of this talk at length about the importance of making our subject more equitable. I focus predominantly on racial equity because the situation here is so stark, but this really is applicable to all underrepresented groups in geoscience. We need to also ensure that we are implementing best practice that supports LGBTQ plus students, those with disabilities, with neurodiversity, with caring responsibilities. There are now many publications out there on these topics. So if you're interested to know more about how you can change your own practice to become more equitable, I would recommend you check out some of the papers that I pointed to here, which link to many more. So this graphic was created by my fantastic PhD student, Anya Lawrence, to illustrate our paper, which stemmed from a blog that she wrote called Six Simple Steps Towards Making Fieldwork More Inclusive. Some of the big picture topics today I've discussed may seem beyond your own time and resources, but there are many adaptations that are achievable for any educators, for example, who plan and lead fieldwork. So again, I would just really recommend having a look at some of these resources and like I've done in the last few years, just opening your eyes to what is out there in terms of support for helping us change and adapt our subject. And finally, we need to ensure our subject survives, not just in a handful of elite UK institutions. There may be some things like A-level structure that are out of our hands, but we need to change what we can change to be cheesy. We need to be the best ambassadors that we can be for our subject. We need to be able to describe that great possibility of our subject, which goes so much further than rocks, and to inspire the next generation to take it forward. Um, so myself and Jen Roberts and Hazel Beaumont have been attempting to promote this with a website called Geoscience for the Future. And on this website, we have um, a Ask a Geo Hub where we link geoscientists with schools and teachers. So we have over 40 geoscientists from all over the world who've signed up to be part of that hub. If you'd like to be involved, please do get in contact. Uh, email us, contact us at the website. Um, we also show blogs um, that are representing sustainable and exciting modern topics in geoscience. Um, it's hard, it's hard to break out of the echo chamber sometimes and to ensure that you're reaching more and more people. But one of our blogs on planetary geoscience on Mars was actually read by 10,000 people during the NASA um, Curiosity rover um, launch. So, you know, sometimes if you're just in the right place with the right information, you can reach a huge amount of people, which can't be a bad thing. And that's me for today, a little bit, finishing a little bit early. So that's a bit easier for the organizers. Um, enjoy the rest of the talks and if you get chance do please check out Georgie for Global Development's website because they're a great charity. Um, I've left up my Twitter, feel free to get in contact, um, but otherwise yeah I'll leave it there. Thank you Natasha, definitely a very important talk there. Um, obviously we're taking questions so please put that in the chat if you've uh, got any. Oh yeah we've got one from Amy Watkiss. Uh, on the sustainability map produced by GFGD, which method do you think is the most important when meeting the UN sustainability goals? That's an interesting one. So do you mean the, the roadmap in the Kenya project? Which sustainability map do you mean? If Amy's still there. Apparently the one produced by GFGD. Um, hopefully Amy will maybe put another message in. I mean, in terms of meeting the UN sustainability goals, I don't think there's one particular aspect of geoscience that is more important than any others. I think that in terms of geoscience as a whole contributes to each of the sustainable development goals in a different way. So the papers that the executive director of GFGD has worked on, so Joel Gill's worked on one with Flo Below that I mentioned at the head of this talk, 
that's a really great paper because it literally takes each of the sustainable, devel sustainable development goals and maps how they relate to different aspects of geoscience. And these kind of documents are what GFGD take when they speak to policymakers. So recently they were one of the recognized observers at the COP26 conference in Glasgow. And having that kind of information to hand is so important in advocating for our subject in advocating for its importance in the energy transition, in locating water resources, um, in leaving no one behind, making sure that people are able to undergo sustainable development in an equitable way. Natasha, we've also got a question from Chris Gilson. Uh, what can we do within our geoscience careers to affect change in diversity from a non-institutional standpoint? Okay, so you mean kind of on a personal level. I think there's a lot that we can do on a personal level. And I would say that before I managed to get any funding, everything I was doing was on a personal level, really, because without time and resources, it really is difficult to work on this within institutions. I think the first thing that we can do is understand the issues is listen listen to the stories of students who are underrepresented in the subject particularly if you go onto the social media platforms like twitter um, hashtags like black in the ivory um, if you go to the black in geoscience or black geographers um, websites all of these resources have people who are really willing to um, showcase the best in black and geoscience for example and you know, when these uh, events happen, so when uh, every year there's like a Black in Geoscience Day, um, I think it's in September time, people share their experiences and there are some really powerful stories. And I think a first step is just listening and understanding that this, this isn't equity for the sake of it. This is important. This isn't equity for the sake of diversity. It's not, we're not saying, okay, well, we just need the numbers to be better we're saying that we need to do this because it's the right thing to do, because there are aspects of our subjects that are currently not right. Um, and I think that the first step in that is just reaching out and listening and listening to experiences that you may not be familiar with yourself. Thank you. Um, we've also got a question from Janine Kavanagh. She says, fantastic talk, Natasha. Thanks for leading this important work. Can I ask how easy it was to access data for some of the statistics you presented? And did you find you had to put out your own surveys to get the data you needed? Yeah, so that's an interesting question because in theory, the data is available, the HESA data, the Higher Education Statistics Authority data, but the website is pretty hideous to navigate actually, um, especially now that they've changed the reporting structures. So you basically can't compare data from 2014 to 2019 with data from 2019 to 2021. But in terms of accessing the data, it is there. And there's breakdowns for students um, by tariff at different universities, by subject, by subject grouping, by age, ethnicity, ability. So there is that data available. But yeah, Janine, if you want to go and have a go at um, mining it, then I'm always willing to give a hand because it is a bit hideous when you first look at it. Yeah. 